Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 through verse 4. As a preface at this time, there is no Levitical priesthood, no Arianite priesthood, and yet a priest appears before the patriarch Abram. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of Man, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. To understand what a tenth of the spoils are, we look at Genesis chapter 14, verse 14 through verse 20. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods, and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shiva, that is, the king's valley. After his return from the defeat of Shadur Lyomir and the kings who were with him, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. In verse 16, we see Abram bringing to Melchizedek all of the goods, and in this context, the word goods is the Hebrew word rakush, meaning property, possessions, or riches. Abram acquired the spoils of war from his recent battle with the Valley of the Kings, who captured the remaining inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, and among them was Abram's nephew, Lot. This battle was a rescue mission to free Abram's nephew and his people. Out of all the kings and their soldiers who were slaughtered, Abram and his trained servants gathered all of the goods or spoils on the slain persons and offered a tenth of those goods to Melchizedek. Genesis chapter 13 verse 2. Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Notice that Abram was very wealthy and gave a tenth of his additional earnings or rewards from the spoils of war and not a tenth from his current possessions or income. Genesis chapter 28 verse 18 through verse 22. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it aside as a pillar and poured oil on top of it and he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been loose previously. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Jacob makes a statement before the issuance of the law, that if God would act on Jacob's behalf, then Jacob will give a tenth, and not pay a tenth. The beauty of the New Testament is that it is already finished. The law was fulfilled by Christ which we now operate in the ways of tithing before the law with better promises. If you are a New Testament believer, the blessing is already on you and blessings will find you. 
It's interesting to see Abram's interaction with the high priest Melchizedek and the giving of a tenth without any requirement or obligation to do so, which drives the question, how did Abram know to give a tenth before the law? And why did he give it to a random priest? To understand this, we must research Abram's historical background of the land which he frequented before God called him to be the patriarch of the nation of Israel. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 7 You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. Now Ur is a city of the Chaldeans of the Mesopotamian state. Mesopotamia included the Babylonians, the Arcadians, the Assyrians, Chaldeans, and others who was fathered by Nimrod, the first king. The Mesopotamian state practiced what is known as the Mass Ratu, one-tenth tax, payable to the Mesopotamian pagan gods, their priest, and local government rulers. Before Abram was called out of Ur, before he became the patriarch of Israel, known as Abraham, he knew to give a tenth to Melchizedek based on his domiciled background of the Mesopotamian state. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 through verse 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through verse 37. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated, Son of Encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. The point of this is so that no one would suffer lack. All New Testament giving was for one thing, and one thing only, giving for the needy, because it was morally correct to do so. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 1 through verse 4 Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Now to some this may sound like the Apostle Paul is telling the church of Corinth to collect tithes once again from a law mindset. But the key phrase to take note of is Paul states the collection for the saints and not the collection of the saints. Verse three, and when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. Romans chapter 15, verse 22 through verse 28. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you, but now no longer having a place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey, and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints, for it has pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. 
For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. Again, we see the Apostle Paul fulfilling the third year tithe in collecting for the poor and the needy. Malachi chapter 3 verse 5 And I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien, because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi was under the law. But this is another reference to the third year tithe regarding the needy or hurting ones, which displays how serious God felt about those coming against helping the poor. Acts chapter 11, verse 27. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Acts chapter 24, verse 17. Now after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation. Alms in the Greek simply means a donation from compassion to the poor. Galatians chapter 2 verse 10 They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 5 through verse 7 Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. The words gift generosity and bountifully is the same Greek word eulogia meaning blessing giving today in the Western world for most has a lot to do with giving 10% of earned wages out of fear of a curse the curse has been here since Adam disobeyed in Eden it is a general curse that affects certain areas of our lives in a specific way to get out of the curse we simply must enter into Christ. So the blessing is on us. Now we can still experience the consequences of the curse if we don't go along with the word. But we ourselves are not cursed. We are blessed since the day we accepted Christ. If we chose to cease giving a tithe or offering for the rest of our lives, we would not be cursed, nor would we be looked upon as God robbers for not bringing in the tithe to the storehouse because God the Father was not talking to the church but to the children of Levi only. The storehouse God is referring to was an actual building to fill with goods. The church is not a storehouse. It gives as it wills, cheerfully, not grudgingly, to those who are in need in many forms other than money. Among many theologians, most agree that tithes and giving was never money under the law and have asked the question, how did the requirements of the law return to the church today, whether Christian or Catholic, being monetary with tithes and offerings? One individual has circled the discussions, being the father of the idea that not goods, but monetary tithing should be collected as a requirement as in the days of the Levitical priesthood, and the monetary gifts should be directed to the clergy. That individual's name 
is Thasius Cyprianus, also known as Cyprian of Carthage, Tunisia of the third century. Was Cyprian, who claimed to be a believer in Christ, the reason for bringing the obligation and requirement of the law back even after the law had been fulfilled by Christ? Well, let's continue in part three of this series to answer that question.